Chapter 3 Contact and Landing 1. Eddie was awakened by an announcement from the co-pilot that they should be landing at Kennedy International, where the visibility was unlimited, the winds out of the west at 10 miles an hour, and the temperature a jolly 70 degrees, in 45 minutes or so. He told them that, if he didn't get another chance, he wanted to thank them one and all for choosing Delta. He looked around and saw people checking their duty declaration cards and their proof of citizenship, coming in from Nassau your driver's license and a credit card with a stateside bank listed on it was supposed to be enough, but most still carried passports, and Eddie felt a steel wire start to tighten inside him. He still couldn't believe he had gone to sleep, and so soundly. He got up and went to the restroom. The bags of coke under his arms felt as if they were resting easily and firmly, fitting as nicely to the contours of his sides as they had in the hotel room where a soft-spoken American named William Wilson had strapped them on. Following the strapping operation, the man whose name Poe had made famous, Wilson had only looked blankly at Eddie when Eddie made some allusion to this, handed over the shirt. Just an ordinary paisley shirt, a little faded, the sort of thing any frat boy might wear back on a plane following a short pre-exam holiday, except this one was specially tailored to hide the unsightly bulges. You check everything once before you sit down just to be sure, Wilson said, but you're gonna be fine. Eddie didn't know if he was going to be fine or not. But he had another reason for wanting to use the john before the fasten the seat belts light came on. In spite of all temptation, and most of last night it hadn't been temptation but raging need, he had managed to hold on to the last little bit of what the sallow thing had had the temerity to call China white. Clearing customs from Nassau wasn't like clearing customs from Haiti or Quincon or Bogota, but there were still people watching, trained people. He needed any and every edge he could get. If he could go in there a little cooled out, just a little, it might be the one thing that put him over the top. He snorted the powder, flushing the little twist of paper it had been in down the john, then washed his hands. Of course, if you make it, you'll never know, will you? He thought. No, he wouldn't. And wouldn't care. On his way back to his seat, he saw the stewardess who had brought him the drink he hadn't finished. She smiled at him. He smiled back, sat down, buckled his seatbelt, took out the flight magazine, turned the pages, and looked at the pictures and the words. Neither made any impression on him. The steel wire continued to tighten around his gut, and when the fastened seatbelt's light did come on, it took a double turn and cinched tight. The heroin had hit. He had the sniffles to prove it but he sure couldn't feel it. One thing he did feel shortly before landing was another of those unsettling periods of blankness, short, but most definitely there. The 727 banked over the waters of the Long Island Sound and started in. 2. Jane Dorning had been in the business class galley helping Peter and Anne stow the last of the after-meal drink glasses when the guy who looked like a college kid went into the first-class bathroom. He was returning to his seat when she brushed aside the curtain between business and first, and she quickened her step without even thinking about it, catching him with her smile, making him look up and smile back. His eyes were hazel again. All right, all right. He went into the john and took them out before his nap. He went into the john and put them in again afterwards. For Christ's sake, Janie, you're being a goose. She wasn't, though. It was nothing she could put her finger on, but she was not being a goose. He's too pale. So what? Thousands of people are pale, including your old mother, since a gallbladder went to hell. He had very arresting blue eyes, maybe not as cute as the hazel contacts, but certainly arresting. So why bother and expense? Because he likes designer eyes. Isn't that enough? No. Shortly before fastened seat belts and final cross check, she did something she had never done before. She did it with the thought of an old battle axe instructor in mind. She filled the thermos bottle with hot coffee and put on the red plastic top without first pushing the stopper 
into the bottle's throat. She screwed the top only until she felt it catch the first thread. Susie Douglas was making the final approach announcement, telling these geese to extinguish their cigarettes, telling them that they would have to stow what they have taken out, telling them a Delta Gate agent would meet the flight, telling them to check and make sure they had their duty declaration cards and proof of citizenship, telling them it would now be necessary to pick up all the cups, glasses, and speaker sets. I'm surprised we don't have to check to make sure they dry, Jane thought distractedly. She felt her own steel wire wrapping itself around her guts, cinching them tight. Get my side, Jane said as Susie hung up the mic. Susie glanced at the thermos, then at Jane's face. Jane? Are you sick? You look as white as a... I'm not sick. Get my side. I'll explain when you get back. Jane... Jane glanced briefly at the jump seats beside the left-hand exit door. I want to ride shotgun. Jane, get my side. All right, Susie said. All right, Jane, no problem. Jane Dorning sat down in the jump seat closest to the aisle. She held the thermos in her hand and made no move to fasten the web harness. She wanted to keep that thermos in complete control, and that meant both hands. Susie thinks I flipped out. Jane hoped she had. If Captain MacDonald lands hard, I'm going to have blisters all over my hands. She would risk it. The plane was dropping. The man in 3A, the man with the two-tone eyes and the pale face, suddenly leaned down and pulled his traveling bag from under the seat. This is it, Jane thought. This is where he brings out the grenade or the automatic weapon or whatever the hell he's got. And the moment she saw it, the very moment she was going to flip the red top off the thermos in her slightly trembling hands and there was going to be one very surprised friend of Allah rolling around on the aisle floor of Delta Flight 901 while his skin boiled on his face, 3A unzipped the bag. Jane got ready. 3. The gunslinger thought this man, prisoner or not, was probably better at the fine art of survival than any of the other men he had seen in this air carriage. The others were fat things, for the most part, and even those who looked reasonably fit also looked open, unguarded, their faces those of spoiled and costed children, the faces of men who would fight eventually, but who would whine almost endlessly before they did. You could let their guts out onto their shoes, and their last expressions would not be that of rage or agony but stupid surprise. The prisoner was better, but not good enough. Not at all. The army woman, she saw something. I don't know what, but she saw something wrong. She's awake to him in a way she's not to others. The prisoner sat down, looked at a limp-covered book he thought of as Magda Scene, although who Magda might have been or what she might have seen mattered not a whit to Roland. The gunslinger did not want to look at the book. Amazing as his things were, he wanted to look at the woman in the army uniform. The urge to come forward and take control was very great, but he held against it, at least for the time being. The prisoner had gone somewhere and gotten a drug, not a drug he himself took, nor the one that would help cure the gunslinger's sick body, but the one that people paid a lot of money for because it was against the law. He would give this drug to his brother, who would, in turn, give it to a man named Balazar. The deal would be complete when Balazar traded them the kind of drug they took for this one, if, that was, the prisoner was able to correctly perform a ritual unknown to the gunslinger. And a world as strange as this must, of necessity, have many strange rituals. It was called clearing the customs. But the woman sees him. Could she keep him from clearing the customs? Roland thought the answer was probably yes. And then? Gaol. And if the prisoner was gaoled, there would be no place to get the sort of medicine his infected dying body needed. He must clear the customs, Roland thought. He must. And he must go on with his brother to this man Balazar. It's not in the plan, the brother won't like it, but he must. 
because a man who dealt in drugs would either know a man or be a man who also cured the sick. A man who could listen to what was wrong and then maybe he must clear the customs, the gunslinger thought. The answer was so large and simple, so close to him, that he very nearly did not see it at all. It was the drug the prisoner meant to smuggle in that would make clearing the custom so difficult, of course. It might be some sort of oracle who might be consulted in the case of people who seemed suspicious. Otherwise, Roland gleaned, the clearing ceremony would be simplicity itself, as crossing a friendly border was in his own world. One made the sign of fealty to the kingdom's monarch, a simple token of gesture, and was allowed to pass. He was able to take things from the prisoner's world to his own. The tutorfish popkin had proven that. He would take the bags of drugs as he had taken the popkin. The prisoner would clear the customs, and Roland would bring the bags of drugs back. Can you? Ah, here was a question disturbingly enough to distract him from the view of the water below. They had gone over what looked like a huge ocean and were now turning back towards the coastline. As they did, the water grew steadily closer. The air carriage was coming down, Eddie's glance was brief. The gunslingers, as rapt as a child seeing his first snowfall. He could take things from this world that he knew, but bringing them back again? That was a thing of which he has yet no knowing. He would have to find out. The gunslinger reached into the prisoner's pocket and closed the prisoner's fingers over a coin. Roland went back through the door. 4. The birds flew away when he sat up. They hadn't dared come as close this time. He ached, he was woozy, feverish. Yet it was amazing how much even a little bit of nourishment had revived him. He looked at the coin he had brought back with him this time. It looked like silver, but the reddish tint at the edge suggested it was really made of some baser metal. On one side was a profile of a man whose face suggested nobility, courage, stubbornness. His hair, both curled at the base of his skull and pigged at the nape of his neck, suggested a bit of vanity as well. He turned the coin over and saw something so startling it caused him to cry out in a rusty, croaking voice. On the back was an eagle, the device which had decorated his own banner, in those dim days when there had still been kingdoms and banners to symbolize them. Time is short, go back, hurry. But he tarried a moment longer, thinking. It was harder to think inside his head. The prisoner's was far from clear, but it was, temporarily at least, a cleaner vessel than his own. To try the coin both ways was only half of the experiment, wasn't it? He took one of the shells from his cartridge belt and folded it over the coin in his hand. Roland stepped back through the door. 5. The prisoner's coin was still there, firmly curled within the pocket did hand. He didn't have to come forward to check on the shell. He knew it hadn't made the trip. He came forward anyway, briefly, because there was one thing he had to know. He had to see. So he turned as if to adjust the little paper thing on the back of his seat, by all the gods that ever were, there was paper everywhere in this world, and looked through the doorway. He saw his body collapsed as before, now with a fresh trickle of blood flowing from a cut on his cheek. A stone must have done it when he left himself and crossed over. The cartridge he had been holding along with the coin lay at the base of the door, on the sand. Still, enough was answered. The prisoner could clear the customs. Their guards at the watch might search him from head to toe, from asshole to appetite, and back again. They'd find nothing. The gunslinger settled back, content, unaware at least, for the time being, that he had still had not grasped the extent of the problem. 6. The 727 came in low and smooth over the salt marsh of the Long Island, leaving sooty trails of spent fuel behind them. The landing gear came down with a rumble and a thump. 7. 3A, the man with the two-tone eyes, straightened up and Jane saw actually saw 
a snub-nosed Uzi in his hands before she realized it was nothing but his duty declaration card and a little zipper bag of the sorts which men sometimes used to hold their passports. The plane settled like silk. Letting out a deep, shaking shudder, she tightened the red top on the thermos. Call me asshole, she said in a low voice to Susie, buckling the crossover belts now that it was too late. She had told Susie what she suspected on the final approach, so Susie would be ready. You have every right. No, Susie said. You did the right thing. I overreacted, and dinner's on me. Like hell it is, and don't look at him. Look at me. Smile, Janie. Jane smiled, nodded, wondered what in God's name was going on now. You were watching his hands, Susie said, and laughed. Jane joined in. I was watching what happened to his shirt when he bent over to get his bag. He's got enough stuff under there to stock a Woolworths notion counter, only I don't think he's carrying the kind of stuff you can buy at Woolworths. Jane threw back her head and laughed again, feeling like a puppet. How do we handle it? Susie had five years seniority on her, and Jane, who only a minute ago had felt she had the situation under some desperate kind of control, now only felt glad to have Susie by her side. We don't! Tell the captain while we're taxiing in. The captain speaks to customs. Your friend there gets in line like everyone else, except then he gets pulled out of line by some men who escort him into a little room. It's going to be the first in a very long succession of little rooms for him, I think. Jesus! Jane was smiling, but chills alternately hot and cold were racing through her. She hit the pop release on her harness when the reverse thrusters began to wind down, handed the thermos to Susie, then got up and rapped on the cockpit's door. Not a terrorist, but a drug smuggler. Thank God for Small's favors. Yet, in a way, she hated it. He had been cute. Not much, but a little. 8. He still doesn't see. The gunslinger thought with anger and dawning desperation. Gods! Eddie had bent to get the papers he needed for the ritual, and when he looked up, the army woman was staring at him, her eyes bulging, her cheeks as white as the paper things on the back of the seats. The silver tube with the red top, which he had first taken from or some kind of canteen, was apparently a weapon. She was holding it up between her breasts now. Roland thought that in a moment or two, she would either throw it or spin off the red top and shoot him with it. Then she relaxed and buckled her harness, even though the thump told both the gunslinger and the prisoner the air carriage had already landed. She turned to the army woman she was sitting with and said something. The other woman laughed and nodded. But if that was a real laugh, the gunslinger thought he was a river toad. The gunslinger wondered how the man whose mind had become temporary home for the gunslinger's own car could be so stupid. Some of it was what he was putting into his body, of course, one of this world's version of devil weed. Some, but not all. He was not soft and unobservant like the others, but in time, he might be. They are as they are because they live in the light, the gunslinger thought suddenly. The light of civilization you were taught to adore above all other things. They live in a world which has not moved on. If this was what people became in such a world, Roland was not sure he didn't prefer the dark. That was before the world moved on, people said in his own world, and it was always said in tones of bereft sadness, but it was, perhaps, sadness without thought, without consideration. She thought I, he, meant to grab a weapon when I, he, bent down to get the papers. When she saw the papers, she relaxed and did what everyone else did before the carriage came down to the ground. Now she and her friend are talking and laughing, but their faces, her face especially, the face of the woman with the metal tube, are not right. They are talking, all right but they are only pretending to laugh. And that is because what they are talking about is I, him. 
The air carriage was now moving along what seemed a long concrete road, out of many. Mostly he watched the woman, but from the edges of his own vision the gunslinger could see other air carriages moving here and there along other roads. Some lumbered, some moved with incredible speed. Not like carriages at all, but like projectiles fired from guns or cannons preparing to leap into the air. As desperate as his own situation had become, part of him wanted very much to come forward and turn his head so he could see these vehicles as they leaped into the sky. They were man-made, but every bit as fabulous as the stories of the grand Featherex which had supposedly once lived in the distant and probably mythical Kingdom of Garland. More fabulous, perhaps, simply because these were man-made. The woman who had brought him the popkin unfastened her harness, this less than a minute since she fastened it, and went forward to a small door. That's where the driver sits, the gunslinger thought. But when the door was opened and she stepped in, he saw it apparently took three drivers to operate the air carriage, and even the brief glimpse he was afforded of what seemed like a million dials and levers and lights made him understand why. The prisoner was looking at all but seeing nothing. Court would have first sneered, then driven him through the nearest wall. The prisoner's mind was completely occupied with grabbing the bag under the seat and his light jacket from the overhead bin and facing the ordeal of the ritual. The prisoner saw nothing. The gunslinger saw everything. The woman thought him a thief or a madman. He, or perhaps it was I, yes, that's likely enough, did something to make her think that. She changed her mind, and then the other woman changed it back. Only now, I think they know what's really wrong. They know he's going to try to profane the ritual. Then, in a thunderclap, he saw the rest of his problem. First, it wasn't just a matter of taking the bags into his own world as he had the coin. The coin hadn't been stuck to the prisoner's body with the glue string the prisoner had wrapped around and around his upper body to hold the bags tight to his skin. This glue string was only part of his problem. The prisoner hadn't missed the temporary disappearance of one coin among many, but when he realized that whatever it was he had risked his life for was suddenly gone, he was surely going to raise a ruckus. And what then? It was more than possible that the prisoner would begin to behave in a manner so irrational that it would get him locked away in a gaol as quickly as being caught in the act of profanation. The loss would be bad enough, for the bags under his arms to simply melt away to nothing would probably make him think he had really gone mad. The air carriage, ox-like now that it was on the ground, labored its way through the left turn. The gunslinger realized that he had no time for the luxury of further thought. He had to do more than come forward. He must make contact with Eddie Dean. Right now. Thank you guys for sitting with another part of Margin Reading The Drawing of the Three. Sorry I've missed a couple of days. I, uh, well, actually about a week or so too. A friend of mine came into town. We took a break to spend some time with him. And then I found out that my mic was broken and I had to take my headset in for repairs. But apparently it's working fine. So we should be back on a daily schedule. Thank you all for listening. Long days and pleasant nights, listener. <laughs>